Now that we know how to use SPSS to do a one-sample t-test, what if we wanted to do a one-tailed one-sample t-test? Well, it is possible, but we're going to need to know a few tricks in order to make it happen. So here's an example of how such a one-tailed, one-sample t-test might be conducted. We're doing some studies on ADHD, and we've been told that this drug, Ritalin, can improve attention for kids with ADHD. Children who have ADHD and are not on Ritalin have an average attention span of 105. We want to know whether the the addition of Ritalin will improve their attention span. It will be greater than 105. So let's walk through the five steps to our hypothesis testing. What kind of statistic are we going to use? A one sample t-test. For the null and alternative hypothesis, when you're doing a one-tailed test, it's easier to start with your alternative hypothesis and then work backwards. So we have 105 as our comparison value. We want to know if Ritalin improves attention, so we're interested in scores that are what? Greater than or less than 105? Greater than. So let's start with our alternative hypothesis. We might say H sub 1 mu is greater than 105. We're only interested in scores greater than or that improve attention. Scores that don't improve attention or make it worse, those aren't interesting to us. So what will our alternative hypothesis be? Well, if we think it through, we have to consider what's left over. We've already established a greater than direction. That leaves us with the equal sign, which we know always goes with our null hypothesis. And what else? the less than sign. So we'll put those together for our null hypothesis. The null is that mu is less than or equal to 105. Any values less than or equal to 105, we will say, are not successful outcomes. Only values greater than 105 are successful outcomes. Those are the only, in, the only outcomes that we're interested in. We're using a one-tailed test, still an alpha level of 0 0.05, but now with 29 degrees of freedom. 29 because our sample size is 30. To find our critical value, you go to your t-test at the back of your notes, look for the columns for a one-tailed test, the subcolumn for 0 0.05 alpha level, and then go down to degrees of freedom equals 29. What value do you find? You should find a critical value of a positive 1.699. Now, in this case, I am only interested in positive values because I'm only interested in increases. I would not write positive negative. So positive 1.99. That comes from the t-table. Now we calculate the statistics using SPSS, and the number that we get is a t-value of 1.797 with 29 degrees of freedom. But let's look a little more closely at this value. Notice that the SIG two-tailed number is, well, I have it hidden right now. So go back to your t-table at the end of your notes, look up the critical value for a two-tailed test, with degrees of freedom equal 29, and for a one-tailed test with degrees of freedom equals 29. These are the values that you should have found. For the two-tailed test, the critical value is positive negative 2.045. But for a one-tailed test, 1 1.699. Now let's take a look at this in a little different context. Let's go back to our normal curve. You see the critical value cutoff point for the, the two-tailed test in the light blue. One of them is at positive 2.045, the other at negative 2.045. The critical value for the one-tailed test is a positive 1 1.699 in the darker purple line. And notice where the t-value is, a positive 1.797. It's between those two lines. So. Is the t of 1.797 statistically significant with a two-tailed test? The answer is no. It does not exceed 2.045. But is 1.97 statistically significant for a one-tailed test? Yes, it is. 
it exceeds 1.699. So the T of 1.797 would not be significant for a two-tailed test, but was significant for a one-tailed test. So using a one-tailed test increases the power in your hypothesis test to find statistically significant results where they exist. It increases the power to avoid a type 2 error. So let's go back to our five steps of hypothesis testing. The statistic that we calculated was a T of 1.797. For a one-tailed test, this is statistically significant. So ADHD children given Ritalin show significant improvement in their ability to concentrate. T with 29 degrees of freedom equals 1.80. You see how I've rounded up our T value. P less than 0.05. Why did we say P less than 0.05 instead of writing down the actual P value? Because that P value in SPSS is for a two-tailed test. We don't know the value for the one-tailed test. All we know was that the statistical significance tells us that it would be less than 0.05. And here is how we would do the APA write-up. A study was conducted to test whether ADHD children given Ritalin show statistically significant improvement in their ability to concentrate. Using a one-tailed, one-sample t-test, researchers determined that the average attention span of ADHD children given Ritalin was mean of 106.37, was, was significantly higher than the typical average attention rates among ADHD children with a mean of 105. T with 29 degrees of freedom equals 1.80, P less than 0.05, indicating that Ritalin improves concentration in ADHD children. So we know that the results were statistically significant. What we should also consider is whether they are clinically significant. So we see a 1.37 point improvement in attention. What we would then do is go back to determine whether that 1.37 points of improvement was really something that mattered on the clinical level. Did it really matter in the real world? But that is a question of effect size. We want to know not just did the drug have an effect, but was the drug's effect big enough to make a difference in the real world? So let's talk briefly about this effect size. The effect size is a measure of how large the effect was in your sample. The most common uh, measure that we use of effect size for a t-test is called a Cohen's D. Cohen's D is calculated by the mean difference, the difference between the sample and population means, divided by the standard deviation. Now this is not calculated for you in SPSS. It can, however, be calculated from SPSS output. I'm going to give you much more about effect size in the next lecture. So for now, let me just show you what the formulas are and give you an easy formula that you could use in some cases. The formulas are contained in your notes, and you see them here at the bottom of the screen. The definition is mean difference divided by standard deviation. Computationally, that is the mean of the sample minus the mean of the population divided by the standard deviation. You could also calculate this by taking your t value and dividing it by the square root of n. There are conventions by which we can compare this d value, the Cohen's d, to determine whether the effect size was small, medium, or large. And this gives us an indication of whether the effect size is something that really matters in the real world.